Eldridge happened to be um, uh, free, but he was on parole and was not publicly part of the Black Panther Party, but Bobby Seale, who was publicly the chairman in, in this armed organization, was serving time in Santa Rita, and the other leaders were either serving time or had kind of fallen by the wayside. They had lost their office. It was a crisis for this organization, and Eldridge asked me, please, you've got to come out here and help me. And when we got our tax return checks refund through SNCC, I bought a ticket, flew out to uh, Oakland, and began helping with this small group of, I think it was uh, Reginald Forte, Sherman Forte, Bobby Hutton, uh, Eldridge Cleaver, maybe Orleander, maybe Emery, and me. Uh, I was helping Eldridge, trying to figure out, well, what do we do? He was in the gas chamber. How can we resolve this? I suggested perhaps you wanted to draw attention to his case by holding a demonstration in front of the courthouse, which was something that was done periodically and frequently in the South. But the Panthers had been an organization that patrols and had other techniques that they were implementing, so that wasn't too appealing. I remember Bobby Hutton saying, well, I don't want to be marching, but I marched for Huey. And so we organized a demonstration outside of the Alameda Courthouse with placards, I suggested, and we got cars and people came around to draw attention to the fact that Huey was coming to uh, court that day. And we sent out leaflets. And to publicize this, I wrote a press release to mail to the uh, newspapers and the television and radio stations, as I had observed uh, being done in SNCC. The idea was that publicity would protect you, uh, that if there was coverage of what you were doing, it was less likely to be violently attacked. And when I was going to mail out the press release, uh, and this is issued on a typewriter, and we sent it in the mail with a postage stamp to, or on a fax machine, I had to identify myself. And so uh, I think at that point, Eldridge and I probably hadn't even got married. So I put Kathleen Neal, communications secretary, Black Panther Party. So uh, you might say I self-defined my role in the Black Panther Party. By the time Bobby Seale got out and the demonstrations out the courthouse with Huey had become a part of the appeal and structure and we were organizing, people were coming back in the party, holding meetings. Bobby Seale created in our apartment at one meeting a sort of a coordinating body that he called the Central Committee. And by this time Eldridge and I had gotten married and so I was a part of the first Central Committee as the Communications Secretary of the Black Panther Party, Kathleen Cleaver. And what I did frequently was issue statements to the press that I would write, write articles for the newspaper about our events, be interviewed. Uh, and at one point, I started, started giving talks. I think someone, Bobby Seale had a speaking engagement and wasn't going to be able to get back in town at some political group or community group. So they said, well, Kathleen, can you do this? And I said, Okay, so I remember writing a speech and writing it and writing it and then going to the event and presenting my speech. I said, oh, that was good. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> so I became sort of a spokesperson and a press secretary and a coordinator of public information and in the Black Panther Party by practice. The concept of the international section of the Black Panther Party is not something that pre-existed. Eldridge Cleaver was invited along with a members of the Black Panther Party to participate in an event hosted in Algeria by the Organization of African Unity and it was called the first Pan-African Cultural Festival. Uh, this is a concept that came out of the Organization of African Unity. It was located in Algiers because of its access to media and travel and the resources that it had to have host uh, delegations from all over Africa. But because it was held in Algiers and the Black Panther Party was invited, along with uh, liberation movements from across Africa, on the theme that of that conference in 1969, that 
culture is a significant part of the struggle for liberation. And so Emory Douglas, our Minister of Culture in the Black Panther Party, was part of our delegation. Eldridge and I were part of the delegation and some other members. The difference is this. What people didn't have to know was that Eldridge had already left the United States as a fugitive, had been living in Havana. And I was on my way to join him in Havana when I found out the day before leaving from Paris to get on a plane to go to Algeria where I could catch the flight to Havana, I found out that Eldred was actually being shipped out of Havana and he was going to be sent to Algiers. So we ended up in this country kind of haphazardly by accident as he was a fugitive and I was his wife and we were trying to join each other. It just so happened the country where that accidentally happened was the host of the Pan-African Cultural Festival. So we essentially met and my first child was born during the Pan-African Cultural Festival. Once there, the idea was, well, now that I'm here and now I see what kind of reception I receive in Africa, perhaps it's possible to have, uh, out, uh, how did they say, liberation movement representatives in Algeria for the Black Panthers as they had for the struggle in Zimbabwe as they had for the South African Liberation Movement, as they had for other struggles. And so that's an, something that we pursued. It certainly wasn't uh, on the uh, original agenda of the Algerian government when they issued the invitation to the Pan-African Cultural Festival, but as ultimately uh, because there was no diplomatic relations between the United States and Algeria. They would get no retaliation from the United States. Why? Because during the Six-Day War, with Egypt and Israel, Algeria had decided, Algeria had fought on the side of Egypt. The United States had supported Israel. Therefore, Algeria and the United States were on opposing sides in a war, and the Algerians had shut down America's representation. There was no Marine officers, and so Eldridge could not be arrested and forced to return to the United States and Algeria. That meant he felt he was free to organize, and pursued the idea of an international base, which ultimately, with the assistance of the Vietnamese, the, represent, the representatives of what had been the um, National Liberation Front, but now had become the provisional revolutionary government, which meant that the Vietnamese by 69 were clearly in their view becoming more so powerful in the United States that they could say that North Vietnam has a provisional government and they will continue and they will defeat the United, defeat, uh, the United States, which they did uh, very clearly uh, within the next four years. But they kind of, so their status had, had risen because of our support of the Vietnamese and the ties between Vietnamese fighters and Black Panthers. Uh, we had their support and ultimately the Algerian authorities agreed to give us this base and that was the origin of the international section of the Black Panther Party which was a place we hosted other fugitives, we put out a newspaper, we had a community center and we maintained connections with radical groups in Europe and in Africa or other places to maintain mostly informational but also cultural and many instances, political connections. I used to respond to that question about the legacy of the Black Panther Party as, well, it's too soon because legacy is something that's left after you're dead and the Black Panther Party, all the members haven't died out. So we're still in the form. However, that's no longer true. Most of the members, if not, deceased are no longer active in that form. So you can say as an organization, there is no more Black Panther Party. So let's look at the legacy. I still say that it's too soon to tell because what the true activities and behavior and beliefs practices within the Black Panther Party were is not what people know. I, I'm very stunned to realize that they have no clue as to the type of things we talked about, the type of things that we did, uh, the programs that we initiated, the ideas we proposed because of the distortions, because of the manipulation. So when they read our own newspapers or see our own files or talk to us, ha, huh, no, they're, they're, they're treated to garbage and, and lies. So 
first, let's get the true history story, the true thoughts uh, about the Black Panthers out. Uh, we had a premise, and that was, we want the power for our community to determine our own destiny. That's point one. We're still working on that. Point seven is the one we became identified with. Point seven we said we want an immediate end to police brutality and violence against black people. We also had some issues with uh, imprisonment and military service, bad education, uh, really the political disabilities and the social disabilities of being uh, what they like to call second-class citizens. We didn't call it that. We called it a colonized people. We have been deprived of our ability to determine our own destiny. The whole concept of black power was, in our case, power to the people, the people of our community. And so our legacy is to fight for power to determine the destiny of your own community, to stand up, be counted, defend yourself, call for an end to police brutality and all other forms of racist injustice and tyranny, which I think is being uh, perpetuated as I speak by the uh, new uh, crowds of young people horrified, horrified at the level of violence and hostility that the uh, police forces in this country seem uh, authorized to dispense in black communities.